What's up, 7th grade? Arrgh. Hope you guys are ready for these teachings on the Eucharist from the Catholic Church. Um... Duh. Hopefully there's some things in here that are going to blow your mind. There's going to have to be so much editing in this. Uh... Hey 7th grade, want to give you guys some thoughts on your reading from this week, kind of stemming back from the note style of videos that I've been doing, and just pointing some things out that I want you to keep an eye on in your readings this week. Specifically your readings of John 6 and Luke 24, both of these have to do with the Catholic Church's teaching on the Eucharist, which of course is awesome that we believe that Christ is present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. We believe in transubstantiation, right? A change in substance from bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, physically there. All of these beautiful beliefs of, of, of the Eucharist, the Catechism tells us, is the source and summit of the Christian life, the Eucharist. And both of these readings this week really have to do with the Eucharist, and the Church takes from these readings to develop her teaching on the Eucharist. And the first one is John chapter 6, which is really, it's long, but it's beautiful. And it starts out with the multiplication of the loaves. And you guys have heard the story of the multiplication of the loaves. Jesus multiplies bread and fish. He feeds 5,000 people and, and more because it just says 5,000 men. I believe there's more than 5,000 people there. And it was so many people that not even 200 days wages would have been enough to feed this amount of people. Which tells us something about Jesus, first of all, that he was pretty popular, or if he wasn't popular, he was at least influential enough and significant enough to draw that type of crowd. Something happens in John 6 after the multiplication of the loaves that is really interesting. Jesus, the people are ecstatic. They're like, this guy just fed all of us with five loaves and two fish. We need to make him a king. He, he like, he's, he's, this guy's crazy. And Jesus is like, he realizes this, and, and he knows that this is not his hour. So he gets in a boat, and he gets away from these people. Well, they come find him. They're like, we need to find this guy because we want more food. And Jesus calls them out on it. And so when they find him, Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal Life. And so we begin to see here some really interesting similarities between the disciples that are trying to find Jesus because they want him to multiply more food for them and the Israelites in the desert. And in fact, we're going to get here in a sec to where we see language, very similar language, and in fact, the same words used by John to describe the disciples in this moment that were used to describe the Israelites when God was giving them manna in the desert. Uh, and there's a clear, clear if, you've, if you've done the reading, there's a clear correlation here. They even reference, John even references the manna in the desert in this passage. But eventually we get to a point where Jesus tells them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. Because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is a big phrase. The disciples are like, what do you mean he came down from heaven? Why did he say I am the bread of life? Like, we know this guy's parents. He's been around here in Galilee for a while. We don't think he's from heaven. Why is he saying he's from heaven? And they're not getting the fact that Jesus is like, look, I am the son of the father. Come, like, Get with the program. And finally, Jesus tells them, because they're not getting the point. Finally, Jesus tells them, stop murmuring. And this word murmuring is the same word used to describe the Israelites who were murmuring and grumbling against God in the desert. So there's a clear connection here between Jesus being the bread of life and the Israelites receiving manna in the desert. And again, we've learned all year, Jesus fulfills the old covenant. He is the fulfillment of of everything that the Israelites were looking for and hoping for. But they're not getting it. So he's, stop murmuring. 
among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. He keeps telling them, I am the bread of life. They're still not getting it, and so he makes it absolutely clear for them. In verse 53 of John 6, Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats, if you look at the Greek word that John uses here, the, the word eat actually literally means to gnaw or to munch, like as if we were eating a snack. Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And the disciples continue to murmur. The disciples said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? And finally, in verse 66, it says, As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. And this is important for us to realize as Catholics, because many Protestant faiths and people who would try to challenge the teaching of the Eucharist, they say, no, Jesus, Jesus didn't actually mean that the bread and wine turned into his body and blood. He didn't actually want us to eat uh, his body and blood. It's just a symbol. And it's very clear here in John 6, Christ did not back down. He didn't come back and say, look, no, this is a symbol. You got it all wrong. No, he maintained, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to have eternal life. And because of that, a lot of people fell away from him. So the Catholic Church's teaching on the Eucharist is not just a symbol it's not something that's wishy-washy and just like, oh yeah, we, you know, we kind of recreate the Last Supper and it's all fine and dandy and fun. No, this is radical. This is Jesus giving himself to us uh, in a very intimate way, but in a way that provides for us. It nourishes us because his, his body and blood we consume and it nourishes us in a, in a physical, real, tangible way uh, that also nourishes our spirit. From John 6, we, we gain this teaching, this beautiful teaching, uh, but also hard teaching that Jesus does not back down from. Furthermore, in, in your Luke reading, Luke chapter 24, verse 13, we have the road to Emmaus. If you guys would have watched Mass live last week, you would have noticed that this is one of the gospel readings, and it's read every year shortly after Easter. And you have these two guys walk into this town Emmaus, and Jesus appears to them after he's risen from the dead, and Jesus breaks open the scriptures to them and teaches them about the prophets and how everything in the Old Testament was pointing to him in the New Testament. And then finally, uh, the, the point that pertains to the Eucharist that I want to point out is that at the very end, it says in verse 30 of Luke 24, And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him but he vanished from their sight. In the last verse, then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. He reveals himself to us in the breaking of the bread. We see that in the multiplication of the loaves. We see that here in the road to Emmaus. We see that at the Last Supper. And of course, we see it every time we go to Mass in the Eucharist. And so Christ wants to give himself to us in this way and he intended for us to eat his flesh and drink his blood now is the catholic church's teaching on the eucharist cannibalism because that is actually something that has come up throughout history people have accused catholics of being cannibals because we say we eat the flesh and blood of our lord the answer is no we're not cannibals and you can rest easy knowing that at night because we're not a weird cult. Early Christians were accused of this. As early as the first and second century, the Romans were accusing Christians of being cannibals because Christians were claiming that we eat the body and blood of our Lord. And there's two things here. First of all, it shows that from the very earliest moments of the church, the, the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist was maintained. That was never disputed. That wasn't something that came later no, from, from the very early church, from the very beginning of Christ establishing his church, it was maintained that, look, we need to make this sacrifice in memory of Christ, as he told us, and we believe that we are partaking in a meal that is his flesh and blood. But is it cannibalism? No. And there's reasons for this. Is One, in order to be a cannibal, the person has to be dead. Okay? Cannibalism is the eating of someone who is dead. 
Are we partaking in the eating of the dead Jesus? No. Christ raised from the dead. He is alive. And when we, when we partake in the sacrifice of the Mass and receive the Eucharist, we are, we are eating the living Christ. We are receiving the living Christ. We don't destroy him. That's another difference. If you're a cannibal, you eat the dead person's body and it destroys them. No, when we eat Christ's body in the Eucharist, uh, it doesn't destroy him. He becomes alive in us and we are connected in the body of Christ. And so to partake in the sacrifice of the Eucharist at the Mass and to receive Christ in his true presence through the act of consecration of the Mass where transubstantiation takes place, it is not cannibalism. We're not destroying Jesus. We're not eating a dead body. We are partaking in a living sacrifice that strengthens us spiritually and physically in a very intimate and beautiful way where we are connected with the Lord. And so what does receiving the Eucharist do for us practically? Well, some really cool things. As I said before, it connects us. It unites us to the body of Christ in a more intimate way because we are actually coming into contact with his body. And also in receiving the Eucharist, we're connected with each other. We're able to pray for each other, see each other in the sacrifice of the Eucharist, uniting our sufferings and our own petitions and our own desires and everything to the Lord in the sacrifice of the Eucharist. Uh, we're able to offer that up just as he did on the cross. It forgives us of all of our venial sins, which is awesome. But because of this, because of how sacred and how special the Eucharist is, this is why we treat it with such great reverence and respect as Catholics. Why we don't let uh, people from other Christian faiths and Protestant faiths receive the Eucharist. Because we believe that when you receive the Eucharist, you're saying yes to God in his entire church. You're, when you say amen at the Eucharist, you're saying yes to, to the sacramental system, to your baptismal promises, to everything that the church teaches. And you're also saying, I believe that this is the body and blood of Christ. And if you don't actually believe that it's the body and blood of Christ, then you shouldn't receive the Eucharist. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have doubts, but if you are living a life proclaiming that I do not believe in the true presence of the Eucharist, and you're not living a life in union with the church, then you shouldn't receive the Eucharist. And you should pray for the grace and strength and the faith to get to a point where you can receive the Eucharist, where, where you do trust that it is the true presence of Christ. But of course, we can trust that it's the true presence of Christ because Christ said so. He said, this is my body, this is my blood, given up for you. And the church that he established, guided by the Holy Spirit, affirms that, affirms that teaching. And so we can trust that when we go to Mass, we receive the Eucharist, that we're receiving the true presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And that is something to praise God for. And so I guess when all this is over, when the corona world is over, we can all go to Mass again and be together. Think of some ways that you can approach the Eucharist more reverently the next time you receive it. Maybe that means receiving on the tongue instead of the hands. Maybe that means receiving on the knees. Maybe that just means making a prayer, uh, offering up an intention intentionally before receiving the Eucharist. Spending time after Mass, instead of just getting up and talking to everyone after Mass in, in the church, stay there, kneel, pray, and thank God who's living in you, who's running through your very veins. Thank Him for being with you and being able to receive Him in the Eucharist. Hope that was helpful, guys. God bless. We'll see you later.